All right. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our planet, our business. Uh, this is an online event that we have put together uh, because we need to talk about our planet and our business and figure out how we can be able to bring those two together and make sure we are focused on people, planet, and profit at the same time. This event is brought to you by the WWF, the World Wildlife Foundation, and I love being able to see my screen, which I can see it, and I hope that you can be able to see it as well. Well, uh, I'm honored today to have a panel of fantastic guests as we talk through what it is we are discussing. Um, I'm going to introduce them one by one as we go, and then we will get into uh, an introduction by uh, Karen, who is the head of the organization that is bringing this event together, and then we can get into our program. So, right next to me here is Mr. Van Shah. He's the Kepsha Foundation trustee and chairman of Bitcoin Africa. Lots of questions for you in terms of industrialization and the impact that's having on our planet. Uh, then we have Karen Bumsma, and she is the one who's been running a lot of sustainable innovations, and she's the director of the Sustainable Inclusive Business Conversation. She's the one who's put these events together. I have been part of this for five, six years now. It's fantastic to see how much it's grown. Uh, next to her is Mr. Isaac Wondo. He's a board chair of WWF Kenya and the chairman of NCBA. It's great to have you. It's nice to be in the middle over there. I see the banners right behind you. It looks really good. And uh, right next to him is Ms. Amy Whiter, Public Affairs and Governance Relations Leader at Coca-Cola Central. We'll talk about bottles. No, That's sorry. not Emily. Emily, sorry, I apologize. That's not Emily. I have to see these things all over the place. My fault. Um, me? Alda. Yes, you're here. Anolda Shun, the Head of Sustainable and uh, Community Engagement for Kenya Breweries Limited. We still have a conversation about bottles, do we not? and see how we can think through what we're going to do about plastic versus glass. At the very end is Julian, uh, Kenyan hip hop artist and recycling entrepreneur. Uh, indeed, it's true, Emily is going to be joining us online. I believe she's going to be our virtual panelist and we have questions for all of you as we continue to converse about what sustainable inclusive business looks like. Karen, do you have a microphone next to you? There? I have. I'm not sure whether everyone can hear me, but I have a microphone. Uh, as well I will get there. you a microphone that it's is there. Uh, it's there. well cleaned. I believe there is one somewhere around. Is there one there? Isn't that the mic? Alex, do we have a microphone at the front? You're mic'd. I have my sanitizer here. We're what? insisting on everyone having a sanitizer wherever you are. Yes, what? give me that microphone, please. I'm going to clean it with my sanitizer. Mm -hmm. Really quickly, kind before I give it to We've you. We've all got mics. That's going to work well on the line. I'm not sure we're going to hear it inside the room. Okay. But let's see. Let's give you a microphone. We've done this before a couple of times. You know how it is. Blame me for it. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. I uh, would like to do a short introduction. Um, we are hosted by the Kenyan Private Sector Alliance. Uh, we run an organization called Sustainable and Inclusive Business. Um, and I'm very happy to be here today with private sector members um, as well as WWF. And the main reason for that is that I think um, it shows that we are finally at a stage where we think whether you are an environmental organization or you are a business, we all have the same responsibility. It's not WWF that is going to solve environmental issues. They have shown us why it's important to talk about this and why we have the responsibility. But we are now, in 2020, ready to actually talk together and make a plan on how we're going to do that. It's really time that we rethink our position and our role, because we're just part of nature. We're all one. We're one people, and people influence the planet. People are using nature. Without nature, there's no business, there's no medication, there is no product, there is nothing. So we have to live in harmony with nature. We should only have a positive impact on nature, because then nature has a positive impact on us. Um, this is not a nice thing to do anymore. This is urgent, and we really need to include it in how we do what we do whether you're running a business online, whether you have a big factory. It's not about the nice things you do on the side, it's about the impact of your action. So I would urge everyone, just look at your own impact every day, 
And I'm also not a saint. We were just talking about <laughs> masks and, and uh, disposables. So we all have our challenges to really change and think of all our actions and the impact it has on, the, on our planet. And for each business, that's, the, that's different. But to have a green business DNA, that should be the new norm. And then we can build back better. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, again, I'm very pleased that we are in one space. We're not different organizations anymore. We're all sharing the same responsibility. And we need to make sure that we thrive and that the planet can thrive. It's not about growth. It's not about one is doing better than the other. It's about thriving as a planet and as we are part of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carrie. That's a powerful conversation. No one expected the COVID pandemic to happen, and we've all done our best to be able to live in a successful manner under the circumstances, but it's true. Masks, gloves, PPEs, and everything else have been a real challenge. So we're gonna talk about that in depth. But before we go on to our five-minute screening, I'll also ask uh, Mr. Isaac Wondo, the board chair of WWF, uh, and the Kenya chairman of NCBA to give us a few words as to why this is important. I think that uh, I'll paraphrase it uh, to, uh, uh, for us to think about uh, from a broader perspective that uh, as human beings we are very, very destructive and we are destroying a lot of uh, uh, the things which uh, technically come uh, free to us from, uh, from nature. And uh, if we continue in this way, uh, we will probably not be able to gift uh, uh, very much to our children and our grandchildren and our grandchildren's children. And I think that uh, uh, for me, I think that we've come to the tipping point, a point to which we can no longer take uh, nature for granted, and we basically have to begin uh, uh, transforming ourselves and uh, changing the way we interact with, uh, uh, with nature uh, for the benefit of all uh, humanity. And the world, uh, Point Fund for Nature has seen a great degradation in everything, whether it is coral reefs or animals or land degradation. And now that we have a pandemic, we saw a little bit of a resurgence of all of these uh, creatures back into the world. So we're going to talk about how the less humans get involved with the world, the more it seems things to work. Things things seem to work. Now we can improve that situation. But right now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go to our next part before we start talking to our panelists in depth. You're going to watch a five-minute version of the film from the Our Planet uh, website, but it's also on Netflix. It was done in partnership with Netflix and the Attenborough, and it's a fabulous thing you should watch. I definitely watched it the second time uh, last night. So let's do this for five minutes and then come back and talk about what you are about to see. making sure that we have sound for you. Welcome to the Anthropocene, the age of humans. We are now the dominant force of change on the planet. Nature once determined how we survive. Now we determine how nature survives.
three quarters of the land surface and two thirds of the ocean are impacted by our activities. In the summer, there is 40% less Arctic sea ice cover than there was in 1980. Almost half of our planet's forests have been felled for their timber. And to make space for ourselves and our livestock. And at sea, our extensive overfishing is leading to the collapse of key fish stocks. The cod stocks crashed back home in Newfoundland, where I was from. And, you know, thousands of people thrown out of work, boats beached, canneries emptied. And that was the real wake up call. That's where I began to understand that there'll be no jobs on a dead planet. The destruction of our natural world is already costing us trillions of dollars every year. Suddenly, the costs of the age of humans are outweighing the benefits. We are at risk of entering a danger zone where we could trigger irreversible and self-amplifying change which could push the whole planet ultimately away from the, the, the desired equilibrium. We are at risk of destabilizing the whole planet. We have just 10 years to drastically right, alter our path before it will be too late uh, to avoid catastrophic changes to uh, our planet. We need revolutionary speed, right? We need a, a green revolution, and it needs to happen at the scale and at the speed of the digital and internet and mobile revolution. And what drove the speed and scale of these revolutions? Business. The same force that powered the last period of global change can also power the next. The business sector has no option but to be a force for change. Successful businesses will embrace the clean technologies that now exist. We don't need to hear it. Are we going to run out of wind and sunshine in Texas before we run out of fossil fuels? I'm betting on wind and solar. First and foremost, I'm a businessman, and the, the original decision was just a, it was a business decision. New ideas and land management strategies will help us protect our biodiversity and feed more people with less land. The health of the ocean is critical to the way our planet operates. Future businesses will respect it as a resource that belongs to all of us, only taking what it can naturally replace. Next generation businesses will design their product lines to fit within circular economies. Waste from one process becomes food for the next. Waste is just a resource in the wrong place. That's even true for carbon dioxide. It's true for plastics. It's true for everything that we think we're throwing away. There is no away. And so we need to create economies that actually have infrastructure that enable that circular design. 9 p.m., yeah. If you ask millennials, what is the purpose of business? 47% said some version of the purpose of business is to improve society and protect the environment. This is a fundamental sea change in the way an entire generation thinks about business. It's going to mean that if you want to attract the top talent and retain them, if you want to win over millennial customers and attract the $30 trillion of capital that's currently being given to millennials by the baby boomer generation, you're gonna to have to have a narrative around how your products are sustainable and, and healthy. Sustainability is now the, the only same. business plan. I, I think that in the future when we look back, there will be two types of companies. Companies that got it and companies that didn't get it. I know which segment I'd like to belong to. The only viable future is one in which business innovates to demand less of our world. In that future, the wild will recover. We can restore the balance of nature, fix the relationship between our planet and our business, and change the way we live on our planet for the better, forever. It went into to the link. It was 9 okay. p.m. It's okay. So there it is. Uh, that is a short five to seven minute clip of what is essentially a massively 
uh, impactful video movie that's been on Netflix for the last three and a half months. It was supported by uh, WWF and also put together by Silverback Films. And it was about the essence of our planet, the economy, and the impact that I'm assuming all of us have watched. Starting with Giuliani at the back over there, just uh, when you watched it, what came to mind? What did you think? What was your first impression? I mean, overall, Konacheki, uh, the animal kingdom is about <laughs> men trying to impress females mm -hmm. na food. You know, and like that's the only thing in the whole cycle. But deep down, yani, what you see, and I, and I re even wrote something down, like um, one of the quotes in the, in the thing, in, some, in Asama, the rainforest diversity depends on no one species gaining the upper hand. And it felt like the human encroachment and human curiosity, which led, us, led, led all of us to be here, yeah. is the exact thing that, of course, uh, taking us back. So yeah. the human curiosity about always challenging the limits and trying to figure out the way forward, you, you, you create vehicles so that you can move faster, aeroplanes so that you can get there faster, and you need so that you can go up faster, is the same thing that actually causing us more harm. So we just need, there's nothing wrong with that, we just need to be a little bit intentional. So that's what I got from the whole film. So it's almost like you're saying we're taking two steps forward, five steps back. Yeah, because <laughs> 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 Yeah, but you know, it's 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 like uh, so the, the the solutions business provides uh, of course they solve one problem at the same time create five more. Yeah, exactly. That's, That's actually a very good summary. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Anona, what, what was your when you watched it? I have a couple of things. A shock. And I say shock because you know when you when you talk about the moon and that was one of the greatest uh, achievements, you know, in the last fifty years. And then in the same breath, you're saying, as much as we've done this amazing thing, we've sent man to the moon, but as humans here on Earth, the destruction that we have done in just 50 years is, is, is shocking. So for me, it was shocked because I think sometimes, um, I think we, there's a lot of awareness around the destruction um, to the environment and, and what's going on. But I think when you put it into context like that, it sort of brings it all home. Um, and then it sort of makes the case that much more urgent. Uh, because when you look at the next 50 years, um, you know, we're all hoping to be here 50 years or even leave um, a, a better world for our children. But yeah. then if that's what we've done in 50 years, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Yep, absolutely. I'm going to skip you, Mr. Amundo, and Karen, and come to you, Mr. Shah, and let's ask you, what was your first impression when you watched that? I think it's simple. Um, <clears throat> When we had everything in abundance, we, we, we didn't take care of it because we thought, hey, this is available, there's plenty, and then we can do whatever. And then we had very few humans. And now we've got more humans and less abundance in nature. And I think it's important that we take extreme ownership right now. Take extreme ownership right now? That's yes, an responsibility and ownership to say, it's my job, it's yeah. my business, it's this, my this thing. Our not, not as a company, not as a business, but as an individual. If every individual across the planet, 7.4 billion, take responsibility, we sort it out, and we say we won't deplete it, we can solve it. Karen, you've watched this many, many, many times. Still, what is the thing? What's the impression that it leaves you with when you watch it? I see there's this big disconnection between us and resources between us and nature even amongst each other there's quite a big disconnect and I find that um, quite alarming mm -hmm. and I think we need to restore that connection that we are all in the same web beautiful beautiful biodiversity web and we are just part of it we are one species uh, in that whole um, so I think we need to um, change the role we play and really bring that connection back if this is what I do what are the consequences mm -hmm. on the other end? Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and you see now that nature will restore. It's us that keep on destructing it. Yeah. So we can, we can do it. And we have the ability. It's also we have to be able to make a mind shift or have a mind shift that really allows us to change systems. We cannot continue with old values changing something that's completely different. Yeah. So if money is going to be the lead, as the only value we put on everything, then we're not going to make it. Emily's online, and, and I, uh, I want us to reach out to Emily. And Alex, you have it? We do? 
Emily, uh, I don't know if you want to give us your two cents. Um, Public Affairs and Government Relations Leader, Coca-Cola Central East Africa and West Africa. On your first impression, when you watched the, the film and how it felt uh, and what it was like to see what the world has become. Emily, you want to go right ahead and speak? right now. So let's, let's, let's close this with Mr. Wunder. Before we start the panel conversation, WWF put this together and did a phenomenal job of telling us where our planet is. Why? I think it, it's a really a recognition that uh, the human being is a very destructive animal. Uh, and I say that with all seriousness because we are part of species. And uh, if you look at all destruction taking place in the world, it's really because of us. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, we recognize that uh, it is only us who can change the direction of, uh, of the planet and uh, humanity in total and all uh, species. The reality is if we do nothing about it, then uh, we will have probably a lot to pay for it uh, before, before too long. So we must, uh, we must define the agenda uh, which will allow us to bend the curve. Structure we have created. So let's talk about that now specifically as we get into our panel discussion. Over the next 50 minutes, we're going to be addressing uh, all the parts we play. We have an industrialist in the building, we've got a corporate company that has you know been the leader in so many ways in, in not just Kenya but East Africa in beverages. We've got a people artist and activist there, we've got uh, an environmentalist in Kenya and all that she's doing to connect businesses and and uh, and, and the environment. Then we've got WWF, which is almost like the, the finger that is on the pulse of the, of the heart of the planet. But we have people who are watching this and listening, who are consumers of all these products, who live in these lands, who, as Karen has said, have isolated themselves from nature. We live in cities, we don't see monkeys, we don't see zebras, we don't see trees. They're those distant things we see on TV. And so my question is- And we have a you, banker too. And we have, that's fine. Yes. <laughs> and my question then becomes, what is the incentive as an industrialist, to do better for the world? And how does that change the metrics of what you measure? I think it's very simple. Um, responsible business, being environmental friendly, being sustainable, makes sense in, in the global perspective. But it also makes you sense, because actually it reduces your cost of doing business. And this is where, if it's done sensibly, uh, everybody can reduce the cost of doing business and therefore give more competitive products out there. So it's not just that I have to do this, it's a wish to. And you say, I wish to do this, and we align ourselves in terms of mind, body, and soul and say, let's go do it because this is what we want to do. And this is the way we will do it in. So rather than saying that, oh, because of government regulation or whatever, you've got to do this, it should be more from inspiration within to say, I wish to do this and this is how we will operate and therefore we won't mess around. In the same way, we want our consumers out there to make sure that they don't dispose of various things in the environment and destroy it. Yeah. So I think it's responsibility on all fronts. But we take responsibility question. as a company yeah. and we do it because we wish to be environment friendly, we wish to make sure we operate at a standard that we we, we inspire other people, but at the same time, I think it's also saying, let's create that awareness amongst our consumers to say, this can be done in this manner, this can be recycled, and therefore, there's a much better way of doing things. To that question of, of getting your consumers to understand and appreciate the change that is required, how do you change customer behavior when they're used to our plastic oil bottles from Bitco, yes. or our plastic containers for bread, or whatever it is? How do we change that culture? I think, uh, a lot of us give plastics a very bad name. It's not the plastic that's a bad name, it's the consumer who uses it. We can recycle it 10 times, 12 times, and we can reuse it, it's far better than anything else today. So when you look at it from a responsible perspective, what we need to tell people is, do not throw it in the environment, go and recycle it and put it in a bin, and make sure that it gets recycled, because it's a 
it's a fantastic resource. Mm. And I think that's important. So that awareness is important. But again, it's happening in, in a lot of third world countries. Is it really happening in the first world countries is a question mark. The other thing is I can't do it alone. Mm. And this is where we come in as, as, as a whole group to say, I do it, but then I need everybody in the ecosystem, every company doing it, and therefore everybody in the, in, in the country doing it. And that's where we bring in regulations. The government needs to come in with saying, we've got these regulations, you can't throw this away in the environment, sort that out, and companies also abide by it. So there are two-pronged approaches. One is the stick and one is the inspiration. Mm, yeah. You work on two prongs. Carol, stick situation. Julian, on the ground. Boo, they will not every time when you reach a tweet. Sir, say at least no copy. Boo, on the ground. Do people see the value of recycling? I think like, they have to connect their livelihood and, and, and their everyday life to, to recycling. They have to see the effect. So we have done a bad job in communicating that. Yes. Communicating um, the connection between that plastic um, and to their livelihood and how their school fees and everything will be paid. But at the same time, you have to realize that you're dealing with uh, an individual who they live in a surrounding which there's no ownership in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because if they, the way they li left from Ushago to Nairobi wasn't from a place of I'm owning this place that I'm living. I'm actually on a transit. So somebody who lives in Dandora is on a transit to Kilimani. Mutoke Kilimani is on a transit to unless they own the, the, the nini. So we are dealing with people who have a certain um, relationship uh, and we have to connect the relationship between them and their livelihood and what matters to them. So, so how, do we do that? how do we create a relationship between somebody who lives in Dandora and Dandora, even if they're going to be in Kilimani in two years? How do we create that partnership? Initially, how we used to do it that we always talk down on people. Yeah. And we're trying to tell them, you know, you know, and like it's never from a place of actually um, your health. So you, you, you go into the kiba, I mean, to, to dispensary, mm -hmm. it all depends on this how you, you, you handle your, your waste, for example. Or um, basically, if we connect it to that day to day, that's how we're going to make this happen. Yeah. And for example, us, we do it through Taka Bank. We're trying to say that, A, e-plastic can be converted into something uh, of value. It can be converted into a unga. It can be converted into livelihood for your children. Mm -hmm. So that, and if you collect it a certain way, like in Dandora, when we're doing the Taka Bank challenge, yeah. we use, if you come with a certain number of plastics, we give you unga in return. And they start seeing value. In a place in Dandora, you couldn't even see plastic. Or any other kind of need. So we have to always connect. I like that. Thank you very much. I see Emily has joined us. Emily, as you prepare, I'm going to come to you with a question about uh, a short video we've watched. Uh, but before I get to you, I'm going to ask Ms. Anola to explain to me, knowing that water is going to be the next thing we fight over as the largest needed resource on the planet, what's EABL doing about water and its availability? Um, so I think for KBL, Water is very key in, in our business. We use a lot of water to produce some of the, the, the brands and the beverages that you know, a lot of people enjoy. And we're very conscious of our responsibility to, to protect the water towers, to protect our source, to ensure that our, as a business we have um, we will be sustainable. But then more importantly, just to ensure that we are not just taking away from the environment and we're not leaving enough resources for our children or you know our children's children. So we've done a lot of work protecting um, the water towers up at Bears, Mount Kenya, Mount Elko. Um, we do a lot of tree planting. Um, I think you know in the last decade we've done about a million trees, planted a million seedlings, and an 85% um, uh, success rate. Mm -hmm. But I think most importantly now is it's like that ingraining. So what we've done as a business is we've cascaded sustainability to, to every function. So it's not just the corporate relations team that are, and I like what you said, you man, about individual ownership. So whereas before it used to be seen as it's an older's job to drive sustainability. So I'm in marketing, I don't really, you know, um, have anything to do with it. But once we cascade it across the business, so marketing when they're when they're branding, um, for example, Tusca, right? They're now conscious to, to to inform you, and I think we discussed this earlier, inform you that um, you know Tusca is made with recycled water, for example. Mm. Just an example, you know. And so then, you know, picking up from what Giuliani mentioned, when you look at now marketing again, we're doing events. 
right? And so now marketing, having cascaded sustainability, we did October 1st, huge event last year. And for the, not, well, we were very intentional about uh, including waste management into the event. So same thing we've been discussing. So when our consumers are coming to an amazing event to enjoy great music, but they're seeing uh, intentional efforts around recycling. So we had a partner, Takataka Taka Solutions, who were working with us. So now you're coming to an event as a concept goer, but then you're you're actually encouraged to, you know, when you finish your your beverage or your plastic cup to put it to recycle it. Yes. And then now, you know, picking back on, on, on water, um, I think so in the factory we have invested in a water recovery um, plant that is that will save us about 1.2 billion cubic 1.2 billion cubic liters of water a year. Um, we are you know, working to make sure that we, um, we replenish all the water that we use in our operations goes back. So the, we're intentional about that. But the key thing is it can't just be the guys in the factory who are thinking about saving water. Mm. It is their whole business has to be united. The whole supply chain. So that actually is a great segue to my question for Ms. White when you talk about uh, Coca-Cola. They announced in 2018 uh, a program called the World Without Waste Vision. And they're committed to putting 25% of all the PEP, PET bottles to be recyclable and also collect 100% of their cans by 2025. I mean, do you want to speak to us about that story, how it's going, and if you're succeeding, can kind of managing, or just, it's just a mess? How's it going? Thank you, Emily, so much for that. That's that's very comprehensive, and yes, we are going to talk about the pandemic in a bit. Uh, but then we turn to Karen, 
and say denial is spoken about what Bitcoin is doing. And we've heard the movement that they're making uh, in plastics. Um, we've also had an order speak um, about EABL and their drive, and now I mean, about Coca-Cola and what they're working to do. Is this giving you confidence? Uh, is the, is, do you see gaps? And how do you feel about this new turn? Or is there no new turn, in your opinion? No, there definitely is, because we have to be all very hopeful and positive, otherwise nothing will happen and nothing will change. So you can't do that with a negative spirit. Um, so, But there is a big need for bringing all responsibilities again together. It's We need also the government. I agree completely with Vimal Shah that it's what we do, but not only what we do, it's also how it's going to uh, be facilitated and that we need to do collectively. So for instance in plastics you can say okay don't throw it in the environment but if we don't have dustbins or we don't have a, a sorting at source or we don't have proper waste management uh, companies, then where does that leave the end consumer and how do they know? So there's still a long way to go because what Emily also addresses is not just don't pollute the environment, it's also, um, and there I see a huge opportunity in the circular economy approach where you rethink first what we are doing and how we're using resources. Is it really necessary to use that specific material for this purpose? Is it necessary or is it the way we use it for that purpose? Can we, can we extend, can we expand the lifespan of the materials we're using? And if not, uh, is there an alternative? Can we have an alternative? So you say rethink actually redesign because a lot of what we are now and we are ha I mean luckily in Kenya we're really getting our head around and also around policies and extended producer responsibilities for instance where we say okay we can't just recycle you know it's how is the material being made where do they end up where have they been used so you really have to think through what we are uh, how we're using products and then you can say okay rethink redesign refuse maybe reduce if you if you can expand the lifespan you reduce the the use and ultimately on the end you say recycle yeah. because a lot of like there are recyclable materials like steel um, glass uh, cement which actually are recyclable and recyclable and recyclable over yeah. and over yeah. again but not all materials will keep the same quality of the materials. So we have to have a look at that. And therefore, improving on PT quality, for instance, for the bottles of Coca-Cola, will allow us to recycle it a couple of times back into food grade quality. And there are opportunities. But again, you know, we need, we need to really rethink, we need to redesign, and then we need to have a system around it that if we say, okay, ultimately we're going to, to choose to use this, and we can only recycle it, that the quality is high enough, that the system of collection is in place, and all those kind of things. And I think um, the hope I have is that we are, able, we are able, we're capable, if we want, like what East African Brewer is doing as well, wastewater treatment, we can do it, as, as a choice. It costs money in initially, and that's where the money problem always comes in, because that's the value, yeah. we, we value everything with money, yeah. everything. Yeah. And sometimes we shouldn't, sometimes we should say, it's a, uh, we, we d shouldn't care that this reflects, it's, it's no money. We need to have an ecosystem where some parts are reflected in value in money and others aren't, but collectively it works as a thriving ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I think the circular economy can come in really handy and it can replace jobs that we then make and absolute. I don't want to talk about circular okay. economy yet, okay. but that's, that's something we're going to talk about just now. But, but now I want to come to you, Isaac, and, and you wear two hats the board chair of WWF, so you obviously see the impact of the world, but also you are the chairman of NCBA, which is a huge financial institution. And then you, as, as Karen has mentioned, see the impact that finances have been hit by COVID, and now they're still trying to push for, for, for more incentive for companies to do uh, world-friendly things. And there's a report that came out, uh, that the Living Planet Report, LPR 2020, it's a publication, you did eight million tons of plastic are leaking into our oceans every year. Now, I just want to mention this. This was before COVID. And during COVID, we are all wearing masks. There are gloves. It's PPE. There's sanitizers come in small plastic bottles, medium-sized plastic bottles, huge plastic bottles. 
And all these things have been disposed of because everyone is afraid that they have infection rates or something. How now can we even begin, listening to what our panelists have mentioned, can we begin to look at this rationally but also financially responsibly and see a long-term plan? What do you think? I think it's an interesting uh, perspective. And I think I I'd like to start uh, looking at this uh, from uh, a point uh, Vima raised, first of all, uh, around, uh, <coughs> around individual responsibility, even before I come back to answer your question. Uh, individual responsibility, because everything starts with ourselves. Mm -hmm. Because if you choose to dispose, and you dispose in, a, in, a, in an irresponsible manner, uh, it then creates a problem downstream for somebody else. Now, the problem obviously is twofold. It either creates a problem in that it doesn't get, uh, it doesn't get uh, credit, mm -hmm. or it creates a business opportunity uh, for Giuliani, uh, mm -hmm. who is ensuring that uh, and, uh, and deal with them from a recycling uh, uh, perspective. So yes. I think that's the first, first level of, uh, of involvement. I think the second level of involvement is around uh, individual companies and uh, the relationship they have with governments. What legal framework do government put in place uh, to ensure that we do the right things? Because these things, unfortunately, are not uh, new. And uh, two, uh, it's not as if they haven't existed before. I mean, I remember growing up uh, uh, in Mombasa, where littering was not allowed. And uh, there were signs everywhere, do not litter. Mm -hmm. One, two, there were bins everywhere where you would actually uh, place uh, uh, any type of litter yes. uh, you had. And so, so I think that uh, from a legal uh, framework perspective, we also need to ensure that uh, we as organizations and uh, working with government uh, ensure that some of uh, the legal framework which existed and actually exist even today are, uh, are, uh, are respected and people don't uh, then uh, do responsible things. I think uh, the third thing is then, uh, I think coming back now to your question about uh, the challenge, the new challenge as I see it, because uh, plastic is a fact. Uh, before we eat, before the 8 million tons of uh, plastic, which is uh, dropped into oceans every year, mm -hmm. we have a baseline of about 350 uh, million tons, yeah. which is already sitting, is there. sitting in there. That's already in there. Yeah. Uh, we are putting in 8 million tons every year. Now we have uh, all the new uh, waste which is going to come from, uh, uh, from uh, PPE and, uh, and whatever else. Yes. And, uh, and I think that uh, it has to start with a clarity in terms of how this will be disposed of. Yes. Uh, recognizing that there is a potential health hazard also arising from, uh, uh, from some of the things. And then how will we make sure that they don't get their way uh, into the environment? Because if they do, they will create uh, a huge problem. Mm -hmm. If you look at typical plastic, it will probably take about 100 to 200 years uh, to be great. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Now, you don't want that in, uh, in your environment. Yeah. If I come back to it from a financial point of view, it was really uh, your, core, uh, your core question. Mm -hmm. It is really an issue as a, fan as, as a financier. We are beginning to insist uh, in all the relationships we have with our customers, especially if we are lending to them to invest. That uh, environmental, uh, environmental issues are taken into account in uh, evaluating any lending proposition. Because we feel that uh, if we are lending to them and they are not taking care of the environment, then there's a risk that uh, somewhere down the line, uh, they will run into some problem or create a problem which will come back, uh, will come back to bite us. So as a principal requirement now for all our lending, there is an environmental assessment yeah. uh, which we undertake mm -hmm. for every business. Mm -hmm. One, there's a legal defined process mm. uh, in terms of the standards you have to meet, and we want to make sure that you meet those standards, and then there are broader uh, needs uh, which we have defined, which we want to ensure uh, that you meet. So if you are polluting as a matter of course, it's very, very unlikely that we will lend, uh, we will lend to you. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, so yeah, Manu yeah, said something yeah, on, on yeah. the chat. He said, 
Uh, dear Mr. Amuno, many years back, I chaired the committee of WWF of Corporate Club. We planted 30 acres of plantation in Mount Forest. Yeah. It was coming out, it was coming out well. Yeah. On a beautiful morning, uh, the representative of WWF and I went to my plane to see how things were going on, and to their surprise, <laughs> they landed. I was going to respond to it. Livelihoods. Industry can afford to borrow money because they have a long term plan. Your debt portfolio is 30 years, 50 years long. Because you can do that. As an individual, my debt portfolio is six months, sometimes two months, depending on if I'm using it. So I mean, you know, it's very small. And I'm trying to figure out how to feed myself this month. Do these two stories. Kuna, kuna disconnect. The same Krugenza and Sama, because what you grow up with, do not litter. Yes. Yes. So, you okay, can have a government institution, kuna, no corruption allowed. No, no. <laughs> 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 but does it mean there is there's still corruption? Yes. 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 So, I feel like uh, until Krugenza Vimal mm. and Anolda, we have to look into. All, all through our value chain. Yes. You know, so from production, kwa uwa farmer kwa uko, mm -hmm. to by the time consumer may pata, and even after using it. Yes. And then now they don't reduce it to CSR. You know, because it could reduce to, oh, every, kwanza sasa hindi ye meanza sa hii, November hapa, utona, mapitas na pigwa, you know, like, um, Everybody's trying to do something for the orphans. Everybody's trying to do that, but actually, because your it's Christmas, it's but, but actually your business has solved a problem mm. by using bidco product means that mboga yangu takuatamu kidogo extra. So you have solved my problem, yeah. but you need to look at the ripple effect of that, which of course is is keen. You, you you've been doing it that watatuni kusifu kidogo, but um, we have to connect. The, um, what do you call it, throughout the value chain, because we always leave it at a certain point. Yeah. So it doesn't reflect the, um, the in it was your, your, your facility as 50 years. Debt. Your debt yes. portfolio. Yes. You know, yeah. I make sense Kabisa to me, you know, because no. at, as, 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 it's uh, about now, trying to figure out the now. Exactly. Emily, over there at the back, I'm going to ask you, there are more cokes drunk every day than there are people brushing teeth. I read that somewhere. I'm not sure where in the world that is. <laughs> 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 no good news. <laughs> but Emily, knowing that Coca-Cola has been able to go everywhere, and there's a lot of people who use them, cans and bottles, and cans and bottles, that's actually most of what you do. Uh, what do you do to educate these people who use your products while at the same time taking care of their life? Speaking, she's speaking. I mean, did you hear my question or would you like me to repeat? Okay. Uh, so, you're speaking to Emily? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. I am, I am, yes. Did you hear my question or shall I repeat? Oh. Would you like me to repeat the question? I like think I had something around uh, uh, what we do to educate the public. That's correct. Let's okay, so I'll proceed. So I, I think there's a lot of work we've done uh, over the years with, and, and again, this is not a singularly just uh, as Coca-Cola, but together with the industry. But I'll speak a, a, a little bit about what we've done ourselves. Um, so, you know, you have to start from somewhere. And of course, we had to do a lot of research to first of all, fundamentally understand where uh, where the challenges around understanding what recycling were. And it was really shocking that even the most educated, the most exposed people did not understand how to separate waste. People, people did not even understand, understand uh, that, that uh, you know, people, people were ignorant to how they were disposing of their own. So, um, and, and then of course, we all know that uh, reaching out to schools is one of the easiest ways to begin because they are organized, uh, they have an environmental class, they, 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 the system is in place really to keep this off. So what we did is just, um, uh, ran uh, three, three campaigns at the same time. And I remember what we did uh, in 2019 until the beginning of this year, uh, pre pandemic, was we rolled out a campaign called uh, Recycle and Winning with Coca Coca Cola, which uh, was a very successful initiative that we ran in 2000 schools in Kenya. 
And uh, it was simply the, the school that man managed to mobilize students um, aggressively enough to collect the most waste was going to win uh, a, a football pitch. Um, the other thing we managed to do was run radio campaigns, TV campaigns. I don't know if you can recall this. It was quite, um, quite a busy period around November, December of last year up until February this year. And uh, we managed to get a lot of feedback, a lot of people calling in and providing feedback on, on how we can you know, improve or what they liked or did not like about what was um, um, happening. We've also worked a lot with the various stakeholders. We hold a lot of uh, uh, workshops across the country, just educating uh, whether it's um, you, you know, leaders in various industries, people in waste management, and even including working with local uh, local government just to at least get to a place where we're all able to come together and put in place the right uh, waste management uh, uh, plat uh, platforms and uh, equipment that is required to move this thing forward. Of course. Um, Thank you, Amy. I, I, I want to pick up on your point. About how you're going to schools, and you're providing them the products. I'll just go quickly to another about farmers who provide water. I've got a question to Cyrus. CEC of the Zene Kuru. And he says, for now, and other key biodiversity areas, legislation to claim them as protected areas would go a very long way. But organizations like EAEA work with suppliers such as farmers. Actually, that was more of a question. But I don't know how it was. Yeah. Anyway, his question was, does, as we wait for that to happen, do you work with farmers directly in supporting places like the Mao and water collection areas in yeah. this country so that it's more than just what happens after the product has been created, right. but also what happens before the product comes to, to the business? So in the business, we, um, we have uh, we, we, we have a program which we call Growing Value Together, and that's created around the shared value. So for us, when um, and, and I think just to answer um, the well to respond to the comment that Manion Chandari had made about the Mao. Um, so we, when we do our internal tree planting activities, we work with community forest associations, and that's just to piggyback from the point you're making because it's that ownership, right? Um, because by the time we we take our whole team, we go and we plant some trees. When we leave. It is the ownership of the CFAs, the community forest associations, who will ensure that they grow and nurture the trees so that we try to avoid a situation where you come back in five years and, and the land is gone. Because then they see trees as an income generating activity. So yes. trees become valuable. Yeah. Now when you look at across the value chain, um, I think you, I had mentioned earlier about how We've cascaded sustainability in the business across the value chain, but this is also outside of the business. So we're moving to a point where um, we'll be asking our suppliers to do more. So for you to do business with EABL is no longer um, going to be dependent on what you can offer, but also we're going to be asking a lot more of you. So we as a business are committed to sustainability. For example, we're planting trees. You cannot be a supplier if you are not sharing the vision that we share. So for example, we have a network of 50,000 farmers. Um, when we recruit, Every year when, we, um, uh, when, we, um, when the farmers sign contracts with us, we are moving to a, uh, a situation, I think this was the first, so this, this last few months uh, when we started our new financial year, we actually had a cohort of farmers committing in their contracts. So this clause was included in the contracts where the farmers were committing to plant trees. Mm -hmm. So when I talk about um, sustainability. And, and, and just, uh, when they say committing to plant trees, did you give them money for seedlings? Did you... Or did they just come in and then we just have faith? How, how did that work? Or as you're executing your, um, you know, your activities, right? We want you to be cognizant of the fact that you, we need you to be planting trees. So when we move away from the farmers, 50,000 of them, we're moving to a position where, so legally, um, our legal teams are now understanding their role yes. to require our suppliers to do more. Yes. Um, we have distributors across the country. Um, and what we've done is we've mapped out all their carbon emission. And we're now, we've also mapped out how many trees they need to plant to offset. So again, you know, these are all things that we're, we're identifying. How much carbon are you emitting? How many trees do you need to plant? And then we're moving to a point where we're saying, listen, these are your numbers. So as part of, you know, you're a, a, a key partner to KBL, you're a distributor, but you need to ensure that you plant 
10,000 trees to offset your carbon emissions. So is there's, it, uh, and yes. Is this something you're building into your contracts and engagements? Or you want that is the plan, yes. That's so you see, plan. first of all, we have to identify, which is what we've done. So yeah. we've mapped out all the carbon emissions and how many trees they need to offset. I'll come back to Giuliani again, because I always want you to tell me how things are on the ground. Because we can write policy mm -hmm. well. Apparently, yeah. Ken has a really good at policy, mm -hmm. right? When it comes to implementation, those things are, wow. Doesn't look right. Yeah, that's good. But you see, if, if it's if it's in a clause, mm -hmm. as a distributor, you have a contract with with the with the business. So you have a contractual requirement to do it. Yes. Come back to Vima. Coca Cola and EABL KBL's number one competition is tea. That's what they're essentially trying to replace. They're not they're not going to say that. I don't work for them, but that's my thought. And tea is drunk with ugali and spinach and meat, <laughs> and Bitco provides the oil to make that. So you are essentially an essential service for many families that rely on Bitco to eat. But at the same time, you provide the products in plastic, um, you have been here generationally, and I'm sure you're seeing a 50, 70 year, 100 year plan for your company to still be here. Talk to us about the strategic leadership decisions you're making, so that whoever comes after you and who comes after that person is thinking about the grandchildren of all of us here and the products they'll be using in their homes and how those impact and affect our society and environment. Thank you very much. I think that's an important question. Um, first and foremost, we've studied the entire value chain and seeing what are the alternatives, what we've got, what we do right now and how we package it. A long time ago, all these oils were available in tins, mm -hmm. right? And then tins were all over. Mm -hmm. And then came plastics and plastics became the panacea. Uh, in terms of saying, well, that solves all the problems because it's reusable, it's recyclable, plus it's hygienic and it, it doesn't break often. It so rust. it doesn't rust also and doesn't have a, a problem there. So that's an uh, issue. I think when it was initial phases, it was being reused by people automatically for water. Mm. And you could see a lot of water people taking, re re reusing it for water and all that stuff. These are the rigid containers. Yeah. And when you look at that, you could see a huge recycling market. Even if you go to the, the markets, you'll see there are a lot of used yellow oil containers, yellow, being exactly. sold, yeah. taken up country for water, yeah. until we all get piped water. I think that's one, one thing. But at the same time, we looked at that recycling, and there's a whole lot of about seven or eight industries now collecting these and recycling them already, okay, and making them into new products. Mm -hmm. Not used back for edible, but for used for water or for anything else. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole recycling industry around it. However, the problem we have in Kenya is if Giuliani was going to put up an industry just to recycle, the banks in Kenya will not fund that. At all. They don't fund it because that's, it's not got a business plan, it doesn't have a customer at the end, it's again based on will you be able to collect or not. And that's where there's a whole risk profiling that happens here. Mm -hmm. So there is no lending there. Now if that goes back to DFIs or to the financial institutions and says oh, it's a developmental function, the DFIs have also become now more of commercial banks yeah. and there's no real development funding available for anyone and that's where we need to have this new effort to say if recycling was to be done even we are part of Petco mm. Coca-Cola Emily knows about this Petco is is, is is part of the PET recycling and we're all part of it the point is um, there are many industries who want to put up new recycling plants but they can't get funding See. So going solo on a development project where, let's say Giuliani wants to put up a recycling plant for PET and start doing that, they'll say, look, where's your customer, where's your supply, and you've got to get all this sourcing from the market, what if you fail? It risks, it's, it's very risky. Yeah, it's risky. And that risk profiling is a big problem. So again, in a COVID time right now, industries are being hit very badly. Why? Our competitiveness is being eroded. Yeah. If you look at the alternatives to whatever you package now, what do you package it in? Even the masks that we wear, could we wear glass masks, no. right? Could we wear metal masks? No. no. You got them in plastics. Yeah. We had to use them, right? And they're better and cheaper. Yeah. Same thing with all that we are using right now, the PPEs. So it's almost as if we're stuck in this plastic space. It sounds like we're stuck in this plastic space. Yes, but plastic is not a bad thing. The question is how we <laughs> dispose of it. It's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. No, take that. This whole thing about saying plastic means yeah. devil is wrong. Uh -huh. And I think you've got to look at it from a perspective, can it be recycled or not? And can we have recycling done in a, in a sustainable manner, in a responsible manner where it is brought in, sorted, uh, sorted at home, put it in and recycle it, mm -hmm. right? And that's, can, that's very, very much possible. So, so there's a second question about thinking forward and how we do this, but then can you let me now bring back the circular economy conversation you had started and, and, and now take all these points. Emily has mentioned what she's doing in schools and in 2000 schools. A school on a, a football field, fabulous. Uh, and Giuliani has talked about, in fact, Giuliani is a starting point. He's talked about where is where can a local be able to find 
revenue from it. And all of us talked about planting trees as a requirement. Well, am I planting trees to make you happy, or am I planting trees because I see the value? You see what I mean? And then now, as well, we've talked about the risk profile of Giuliani's trying to build up businesses. And as Vimala said, it's tough to get money from these banks. How do we build a circular economy when the facts are not necessarily stacked up against you, but it's not easy either? How do we do it? No, it's not easy at all, but it's exactly uh, to bring all those elements together. And again, I, I keep on hammering on that. We need different values. We need a different system. And that you can't build with the current one. You can't do that. We have amazing, um, we have waste. Waste is not waste until we label it as waste. Waste is just in a wrong, it's a material in the wrong place. So if you have waste from sugarcane and you create briquettes out of it yes. as an alternative for fossil fuel, how is it possible that we say that that's too expensive compared to a tree while we have a ban on logging? Mm. Ah. So, <laughs> so we have a tremendous issue in this country uh, because we need to increase our forest covering mm -hmm. and yet a briquette cannot compete with a tree. That boils down to value. And therefore, we really need to change the value sets. We can't always say it's too expensive. It's also what Vimal saying, why would you not invest in the recycle plant? If this is our collective future, if that is going to solve an issue, why is that too expensive? A against what? Against, against the disaster we're going to face? It, it, can you can you value that? Like it is too expensive That's compared what, to what? Compared to what? Yeah, what's Com the yes. What what is that? Yeah. So and then I think we have to keep on thinking. Yes, it's great if you can recycle it. Plastic is a great product. We're only using it for 60 years. Let us not tell ourselves that we can't change it because it has been only there for 60 years. Mm -hmm. We were living without it. Yes, it has improved a lot of things. We are healthier, we can package hygienically, and all those kind of things. We can transport lighter, and so we reduce sometimes on carbon emission. Yeah. And yes, plastic is only a problem if you look at how we manage it. Yes. But not only how we manage it, it's also the choice for, do we really need it now? Yeah. Do we really need it for this product? Do we need it for that? And if so, is the quality high enough? Because again, I, not everything is recyclable. And also again, what is the choice of a consumer? What choices what do choices I have? Exactly. I mean, I, you can say it's my responsible to not litter, it's my responsible to recycle, but I didn't ask for pasta in a plastic packaging in the first place. I want a broccoli, I want pasta. I didn't ask for the packaging around it. And that's, that's a different mindset, and that needs to come from businesses as well. Businesses like, let's face it, we're also change, like people saying, oh, all the people in the textile and apparel industry are suffering big time because of COVID. Yeah. And people cannot get paid because H&M is not placing the orders. The question is also, if we want to solve that issue and have everyone in a job, does that implicate that we need to stick to fast fashion? Is that really what we need to do? Mm -hmm. But what does it require to change the whole system? I think it, to go back to East African breweries, you have to, again, you have to look at what you can do and what you can do in your value chain and where the impact is. I think procurement, because that's actually what you're talking about, yeah. procurement is super easy. Everyone should do it. You just impose your rules upon others and then only then you can do business with, with, with them. So it's a great tool. It's a very powerful tool to just say, listen, suppliers, these are our core values and we need everyone to comply. So I think it's great. Again, planting trees is one. Growing them, having indigenous, and thi like you can grow them in the mouth forest, but if people can't have food on the table by the end of the day in that area, you will never manage it. You have to not plant trees. You have to build a thriving ecosystem in the Mao forest. Probably, if you want to grow trees in Mao forest, you have to actually provide jobs on the other hand. You have to start building schools on, on, the, on the right, and you have to make sure that there's no human nature conflict at that space. So again, and I just want to highlight something else. If you think about um, system change, and I'm, and I'm talking about values, why is it that we don't have, for instance, like water use? In Kenya, we lose a lot of water also just through uh, leaking pipes and all that and just spilling water. Because once you have access to it, it doesn't really 
have a value. Yeah. Why are there not um, uh, credits? Why do I not have credits for so many liters of water? Uh, Vimal has the same. I'm just saying that. It's kind of like carbon credits, you mean? Oh, you oh. have you have so yeah, much no credits carbon. for this. You have uh, you. Everyone is entitled to have this much water, mm -hmm. this much electricity, even Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is it a privilege to be on Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. and yet it's it's providing us jobs and people who can't go online? Mm -hmm. They don't have work. So, why not make a few essentials? Um, uh, accessible in. No, if I don't need my credits for my water, I don't use them. Then I have them left. I won't waste them. I will trade them. Mm. I will give them to Vimal, Vimal because he needs them for his factory. Yeah? Um, I will give them to East African breweries. So we can make a choice of how much do we need and what does that take from the complete society. Yeah. So can we create different value sets? Thank you for that. So one we, I like that you wear two hats because it becomes tough <laughs> <laughs> to answer the question with one perspective. Because now you have to look at what Vimana said about, mm. about debt, mm. and, and you will not give uh, a recycling in a company you know, 250 million shillings to build it out because it's good for the environment. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Whereas Bitco, Coca Cola, and EABL, though they may say plant trees, it is not part of their core business. Uh, that there are more trees in the world. They still have to do their bottom line. And now, as Karina said, that circular economy is required for this to really hold water. Germany, you've seen in the course of this last week, 2030, if you're selling a car that's uh, purely diesel, they're not going to allow you to do it. I think the UK wants to do the same thing. Companies that are working on, in fact, it was, I believe, Monday when Kenya Power put out the front page news story and they said people are doing solar. And, and they, they are complaining, but on social media, everyone is moving to solar. My parents and I are one of those because it's inconsistent, it cannot, you know, it cannot be relied upon, and all these other things. So my question to you now, based on what you've heard, knowing that, first, it's not necessarily profitable to help the planet, necessarily, when it comes to investment especially. But second, the more, which is 1964, we were 4.1 million Kenyans. Now we're 47 million. Bitco had 10 customers in 1963, based on those numbers. Now they have 10 million customers. So how do we build a society, both as a financier, but also as WWF, that creates environments to support a circular economy, okay. based on those, those traits you've had? It's a tough question. Keep taking time. It's tough. I In see you interesting. No, no, I'm, not, I'm actually not stressed up, because uh -huh. I think I want to start with uh, what I consider the easy one. I think that uh, uh, perha perhaps the notion should be that uh, Financiers are not there to give money, but to support uh, to support business and to support industry. Once they understand what the business is doing and how it is doing it, with all the consequences that business has in uh, the ecosystem uh, we operate in. So I don't agree with Vimal's comment mm -hmm. that uh, banks don't finance uh, recycling and things like that because they do. They probably sent, set some very, very <laughs> different, uh, they probably set some, yeah, they, <laughs> they, probably set, they probably set some very, very different benchmarks uh, for those. That's one. Two, either haven't invested in sufficiently understanding the supply chain to ensure that the outcome at the end of it is one which will ensure if they lend, the money will be paid back. Yes. So that's the that's principle, and that principle doesn't change yeah. in whether you are talking about recycling or you are talking about Vimal setting up a factory to produce products for the consumer. For mm -hmm. the consumer. The principles are the same. Principles yeah, finance. the principles are the same. Okay. So the question is, what's the level of understanding? Uh, what, what is, how, is the, how is the risk assessed? Yeah. And how are the outcomes mm -hmm. basically assessed? That's the principle of all financing. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, uh, the scrap metal market is uh, fully financed by uh, the commercial yeah. banking center. I know, because we finance at least four of them. From an from an NCBA perspective, mm -hmm. which feeds into the steel industry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. So this yeah, is a straight yeah, line yeah. side. Yeah. So it's a question of understanding. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So that I think the financing side is uh, is one issue. I think if and we then. Have seen that yeah. in the recycling space, or is it still that, not? Is I, 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 I think it's it's probably nascent. Mm -hmm. Requires to be better to be better understood. Yeah. Uh, but I believe that uh, it is going to be dealt with mm -hmm. once all the information is put together in a rational in a, in a rational manner. Because uh, if you think of the recycling industry. It is very, very, if I look at it uh, in terms of uh, the, first of all, starts with the home. Mm. 
the distribution, the, the, the separation point, the collection. then the collection yeah. point, yeah. Yeah. then where does it actually end up? Mm. And uh, those are the things which uh, anybody who is financing that type of business would need to understand. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and tell me now yeah. about the WWF angle. I think if, 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 if I come back to the WWF angle, it's really for me, I think the critical issue is to look at uh, the partnership frameworks which are there in place and the power of one organization like KEPSA and two industries to come together to basically appreciate that uh, the world we live in today requires an investment in our thinking and in our time and also some financial element uh, on a partnership framework which allows us to begin solving the problems uh, which we see uh, day to day. I think the expectation that uh, government will solve them uh, for me, is uh, I see as a very, very big challenge mm. if we are expecting the government to solve them on their own. Mm. And so partnerships which allow us to, uh, to work together uh, to change uh, our, our approach. One, uh, I think uh, Giuliani talked earlier about uh, it's November. Uh, we are going to begin seeing a lot of uh, activities which are social in nature uh, to support uh, the less fortunate and, yeah. uh, and all that. And I think my, my view is we need to move away from that social uh, responsibility uh, type thing, or charity type thing, yeah. into, uh, sustainable. into, into sustainable uh, social uh, responsibility in which we are actually we are ma we, we are making investments in things which uh, uh, which can 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 grow legs and actually become useful uh, to broader society. Uh, I mean, I want to pick up a point which an older an older nobody can hear. I had to pick up a point an older med around uh, protecting uh, protecting uh, the rainforests yeah. as an example mm. because uh, reliance on water if you look at rain patterns in this country they've changed quite considerably there are a couple of water towers in this country which need to be protected if we yes. don't do yes. anything about yes. it my question would be for both breweries and coca-cola mm. where do you think the water they need to it's produce a problem. product uh, they produce is going to come from. Not to mention it, yeah, that they, they have, they, the people have to choose between exactly. coke and, 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 and exactly. So, so it it will come to a point where we will all be fighting over water yeah. and everything else That's correct. will be very irrelevant. That's the new big resource. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so so as we come to towards as we're winding up, and I'm hoping our technical team is taking care of the hearing. There's there's two people I want to add to this conversation. But I mean, I can see even have a question for you. But there's uh, there's Elizabeth Waluti. She's a young environmentalist and climate activist, founder of Green Generation Initiative and head of campaigns at Daima Coalition for Green Spaces at the Wangari Maathai Foundation. I think we have her online at some place. We do? Oh, here you are. Here, oh, Fata, there. You have a question? Please ask. Give her a mic. There's a microphone next to you. Thank you so much. So it's a question that comes through a contribution. So when I was watching that film, I at some point I felt so much hope seeing the plants and animal species around. But it kept me thinking what will happen because at the end of the day, we may soon lose all those species of plants and animals. And the big question is who is going to end up bearing the burden of having these species lost? And I know that we've talked a lot about millions of people depending on our natural resources for survival. But still, those resources remain under risk due to human activities. So it clearly shows that if we continue with business as usual, our plant is going to get to a point where it can no longer support life. And of course, it's a challenge to us all. It's a challenge to everyone. And the good thing is that we have shifted the conversation from blaming to talking together to discuss what can we do to to, 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 what can we do to challenge what we are doing right now and what can we do to change the situation? So it's clear that we need to focus a lot more on where we are placing our money. And I think there has been a lot of conversations about pulling investments out of fossil fuels. And my question goes to how can we now ensure that we also pull investments out of every activity that is fueling biodiversity loss and out of every activity that is also fueling deforestation? Because we have also mentioned about risks, and while every action involves risk, it's more riskier to refuse to act. So I think uh, we need to discuss and figure out how can we transform our businesses 
to make investing in nature the new norm. So I would love to maybe get a feedback on that question. How can we make investing in nature the new norm in all our businesses? Well, let's start with Emily. You heard the question, Emily? Nancy can't hear the time speaker. I don't think Emily can hear us. Okay, so we're going to get back to her. So let's start with Julian. What do you think? Mia, I think overall, Yanni, can you check it? First of all, you said earlier that is, uh, you mentioned that it's, it is not profitable to help the planet. Mm -hmm. Sindio, that's how it seems. Sindio, yeah, yeah. for me, I think we just need a mind shift. A mind in, in what is va value in Nini. Mm. Oh, no, no, because, um, like, for me, especially now, when, like, let me give you an example. So, in my, ho in my house, I separate my plastics, I put the plastic scandal. I put the paper candle and I put organic whatever candle. So is the organic nezana ni fanenao farming kidogo kwa hao. No no. And why in wide up space as an artist, um, most of the companies that we're trying to reach out to, we tell them and yajim, we actually refuse some gigs simply because by saying oh do our values around this climate change or do our values around this is an uh, uh, uh. And if you get me to perform, you at the same time have to allow the taka banks and the youth groups because we are pr providing employment for young people and they see value in being part of the the, the value chain correct, yeah. so i think we need to have a mind shift of what what is value in the first place so let me ask you that on the what is that you divide your garbage i wonder how many other people here do the same thing in their houses what gave you that incentive you, we have to come from a place of, I have to agree that I come from a place of leadership. Eh? Mm. And I can't, because we always say, oh, we need individual responsibility. Mm. But I think the individual responsibility comes from a place of, people come from a little bit from privilege. So yes. Vimal is from a place of privilege, and I assume, <laughs> and I assume from a place of privilege, Kuniliko. Mm. So whatever Vila, Vimal does, when it comes to how he does his business, the way he even wears his tie or not, you know, nah, it triggers somehow it's a place of leadership from my point of view so sometimes sometimes we do things not because uh it makes us cool to do it or because whatever it's because it's come with the responsibility whoever much is given much is expected uh, yeah i know just keep going yeah i think i agree with him and i'd like to just um you know go back to a point you made earlier two points the first one being about um whether it's profitable for the for businesses I think it is, because if I give you an example of, of Kenya Breweries, we announced recently a 22 billion shilling investment in renewable energy across three sites in Kenya and Uganda. Mm -hmm. Now that will reduce our carbon emission by 42,000, it will create 900 direct and indirect jobs, mm -hmm. and then we'll be able to use um, solar to provide a tenth of our power needs. So if you just take the solar angle on its own, it will be profitable for us as a business because that um, solar, the solar power right, will reduce our our bills yeah right yeah. i think already we have um we're very focused on energy efficiencies and we are actively reducing our, our bills to kplc mm -hmm. to a point where you know and, and i like karen when you mentioned about briquettes because as we are thinking about biomass or so moving to biomass in this investment right they will will be creating a whole value chain of i, I almost want to call an army mm -hmm. of people that will supply the raw material that we need to fuel our, our, bio, our biomass uh, mm -hmm. boilers. Mm -hmm. So yes, it can be profitable. And I think going back to what Giuliani said about, it doesn't always have to be an incentive, but as businesses, as Kenya breweries, as Coca-Cola, we are influential. So despite the fact that I might require my farmer in a contract or might require him to plant a tree, but that is, that is my responsibility. That is how I influence more people because I'm at a point where I know what it means to do, to do good and to save the planet. So if I can, if I can make my distributors join me, that will, that will mean our planet will be at a much better place because we're reducing our carbon emission. And I think it's just, if, it's, if one person can, even from this room, if one person can go home and decide to do like Giuliani and separate their waste, that is one more person going back to what Vimal said about individual. And, and th that's what we need. Influence is a big thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. and, and Isaac, I'm just going to keep going on with you. What you no, I, I, I think that uh, probably just to add on to uh, uh, some of the issues which have been raised. For me, I think the critical issue is. Uh, a very major change in uh, in uh, in uh, in mindset, mm. um, and I think to recognize that, uh, and, and that's, but this is how I started this conversation uh, this this morning, is that uh, it's about us as human beings uh, to basically realize that. Uh, 
either we are in control of, uh, of uh, the environment we are in or we are not. If we are not in control of it, then we will destroy everything in it with ourselves yeah. as part of it. Mm -hmm. If we are in control of it, we will begin bending uh, the curve and begin allowing the world to survive mm -hmm. uh, beyond uh, perhaps uh, uh, the next uh, couple of millions of years. Yeah. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I agree. I mean, it's upon us, so it's us who need to change it. Um, and I think also, not in terms of incentive, but I think we are the next to be extinct. Might not be the elephant, yeah. might be us, because we think we're a very special species. <laughs> but you have seen COVID. Imagine this one being more deadly or more vicious. Uh, it's just about how successful a species is, and, and su success is about adaptation to your context. Uh, the why are we still here and the dinosaur is not? We had climate change millions of years ago as well, but it was not caused by us. Mm. Now we are instrumental in what happens to evolution. Mm. We are changing evolution. Mm -hmm. It's us. So I think the sixth extinction might be us. We think it's not, but this virus is quite successful. It's controlling us. Imagine a slightly different one, and that is called success. In evolution, that's called success. That's the ones that survive and adapt and take over. And so I think that might be enough incentive to think, <laughs> let's, let's live in harmony with nature so nature can take care of us with the elephants and with wildlife in it. I think. Uh, Richard Leakey would always say, like, the rules of conservation apply as much to us as to wildlife. Yeah? So I think that should be an encouragement and, uh, and a warning. And we have seen it now. We got a warning. Yeah. But the next virus might be more successful. Um, and so we need to adapt. And the adaptation is in mitigation, those, those things that don't work actually. We need to mitigate and we need to close those gaps and we're able to do it. But it's, uh, it's what you say, it's between the, it's between the um, two ears and it's about our thoughts towards it. It's a, um, I think ultimately we need to change a collective consciousness. We are now, this is our reality and we think that that is what it is. It's factual. Yeah, it's, not. it's not. We've done this industrialization. It came across 300 years ago, 200 years ago. We've just started really manifesting it. Mm -hmm. So it's our current belief system, it's our current collective consciousness, but we can change that. And um, we can change and choose to change that every day. Wow. Uh, uh, Emily White, I'll be coming to you shortly, and Nancy, you're very glad to come to you as well. But Vima, thoughts on what I've just been said? What is your opinion? Knowing that Donald Trump denied climate change. I think uh, <laughs> there's something called the reality, the truth. The truth remains the truth. We can put many perspectives to it. I think this just needs to become a mass movement, right? What everybody has said today is mindset change. Yes, it means I, as an individual on this planet, take this as my planet mm. and my responsibility. The minute we do that, we're all sorted. Because then you start saying, I take responsibility for not polluting. I take responsibility for this and that. Plus, I think this law of economics will need to change. Mm. Because when you look at what bankers look at it from perspective of the risk perspective, everybody looks at anything in environment as, as, as a risk, right? Mm. And we talked about natural resources. Mm. I think we've got to convert that to say natural capital. Rather than looking at it as a resource. Resource means I go and extract, exploit the resource, take it and make money from it. So take the entire timber industry, this, that, what not, and they're all doing that. Okay? We're moving everything to paper now. Mm. Now paper is very environment friendly, I agree. But look at it. How many people are planting those trees? It's not. And therefore when we talk about converting to something else, you, you have a problem. Water, and I put it to you, uh, water, there is no shortage of water in this world. So it seems. There is so much water. Look at all the oceans, right? All that ocean that we've got is increasing. Yeah. The melting happening in the North and South Pole. When you look at that, the water's there. We just put in desalination plants. Mm -hmm. You put them across the, across the coast, you have enough water, potable water, to supply the whole of Kenya. Do we have that as a big mission? Will a bank finance it? Will the government say, yes, let's do that and let's pump water up country and everybody has enough water? 
these are the projects that are required, yeah. not the, you know, when it's, a, when it's a very sexy thing like political, we go and say, let's spend more money on a referendum, this, that, what not. Yeah. On these sort of things, nobody wants to touch it. No. What's happening in solar? I think KPLC is fighting against solar right now because it's going to destroy them. Yeah. And solar is the only solution. If, if, if you're moving to solar, why are you doing it? Because the costs have come down. Mm. The cost of your power will be three US cents per kilowatt hour. We're being charged 18 cents by KPLC. So you're going to make sense out of it. Because it makes money, you're moving there. Yeah. Ten years ago, we moved from all hydrocarbons to biomass. And all our boilers across the country, across East Africa, are all biomass. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Mm. Yes, and we take any agro waste that we get. Mm. Today, there's a shortage of agro waste. There's not enough coffee house, there's not enough macadamia nuts, there's not enough agro waste available. So what happens? Go back to wood chips. And that's the only solution that happens, right? Wood chips is forest. No? I'm just saying that's where, that's where it goes back to. So again, agroforestry and all that stuff yeah. needs to become more, what like Karen was saying, sustainable agroforestry mm -hmm. where people see it, I grow it for 10 years, I cut it, I get another tree, I replant, and that becomes a business, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. There's a mass movement required here to say, can we make it better? Again, grazing. I think if you see the, our planet, you see actually grazing is what's destroying our, 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 our ecosystem. So instead of grazing, let's do zero grazing. Yeah. We do animal feeds and we're doing a lot of that stuff right now. But people still want to go and say we're grazing. Why? Because it's cheaper. It's cheaper. Those kind of problems. So this requires, I think, so the whole planet issue. We all take responsibility and we say it's our responsibility, not yours and mine. And again, how you act when there's nobody in the room and it's dark and there's only a mirror there. That's important. Otherwise, we're all doing it for cosmetic purposes, just to show and look good. I think the looking good should go and say, fine, let's do it. Mm. A mass movement is possible. It's like the Mathai, Wangari Mathai movement, right? And we can do that. It's, it's not difficult to it's do. But it stuff. goes back to everybody's heart to say, I will not do this. I will not spoil it. If everybody keeps their front yard and backyard clean, the whole continent, the whole world will be clean. Emily, I hope that you've been hearing us. Please, please give us your two cents on what, what's happening. Uh -huh. So I'll combine, uh, I'll combine my response uh, with the, the, the someone who asked a question just uh, shortly before uh, my fellow panelists uh, started to respond and also just what, what my closing is from, you know, not just from a Coca-Cola perspective, but also uh, from a Kenya private sector alliance perspective. I think I'm this business cannot succeed in a failing society period and so businesses just have to take an active role in leading this transformation um, and businesses that um, that will take this on will ultimately be better placed to harness any emerging opportunities in the market you know the global challenges that we have today whether it's climate change whether it's water and food crisis uh, poverty conflict just name it they are all in need of solutions and the private sector can deliver these solutions and they represent a large, these issues rep represent a large and growing uh, market for, for business innovation. So we are very well positioned to um, improve our environment and communities. If we look just at some of the developing countries uh, in the world, 84% of the GDP, just, just 84%. Of the GDP and 90% of employment sometimes is, is driven by the private sector. So really, we have a very important um, a, a role to play. And if there are companies that have not caught on to this and are not thinking about how they will um, embed environmental and uh, social sustainability within their businesses, they're not going to be around in the next 50 years. And there is a growing body of evidence for indicating that sustainability factors influence financial returns and, and, and they present an opportunity to drive um, long-term long growth for whatever industry or business that you are in. Those are my two cents. 84% of GDP and 90% of employment is private sector. That would be one just be clear about Nancy Vivenga is the head of conservation programs and she has some perspective. Uh, Nancy, are you are you good at? Yes, I am. I've been trying to join. I hope you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Give, give us yeah, first. thank you. Uh I'm I'll just I think pick from what
planet. We cannot offer jobs on a dead planet. Uh, but importantly, that I, I think the private sector and the businesses are central in providing solutions. And we have seen this happen across uh, the world. We've seen this in Kenya. I think one of the panelists talked about you know, sourcing sustainably. And if we demand to source sustainably, then those who supply are forced to actually do it sustainably because there's a market and it makes business sense. So I think that is what I'm hearing. Uh, uh, and as an organization, we feel this is not a task for any single person. Uh, uh, the CEO uh, of Bitco has said this. It is not. It is individual uh, responsibility. It is, you know, corporate. It is collective action that is needed, uh, because the people. And I say this uh, due respect to Giuliani. The Giuliani and I think Elizabeth, who is also in the panel, are the ones that will live on, with the consequences of our actions today, if we don't change uh, what we need to change. Our businesses, uh, Kenya as an economy is mainly nature dependent. And if therefore we draw and withdraw all the capital that this nature is providing us, then we'll not be able to survive, whether it eat jobs, eat the businesses. And therefore I see and uh, listening to the panelists today uh, that you know the, there is the commitment uh, and there they are the actions that we want to do together because we cannot prosper uh, differently. Uh, the solutions will come from ourselves. The solutions will also come from the private sector. They'll drive this, even as we all join to see, you know, a, a world that is different and is more sustainable. Yeah, so I, I think this is what I carry uh, from these conversations today. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. Solution programs and those are beautiful perspectives. And thank you to our panelists for the time you have taken, for being out here, for giving us all the, the feedback you have. And I just want to ask in closing, uh, if Karen and Mr. Wondo would just say three words as to what do you feel in your heart <coughs> is missing and what do we need to do, except personal responsibility, to make this come, become a reality? Karen. I think we need creativity, imagination, because if you imagine, you can create. Um, and I think we need connection. To add on to Karen's uh, points, we need to collaborate much, much more deliberately, as opposed to collaborating when we only must. Mm. And thank you very much to everyone who has participated on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, and our panelists on Zoom. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Nancy, for being there. We appreciate everyone who's coming to the Zoom uh, call, and we know there's going to be videos out later if you want to look at this. Uh, but big shout out to, to Giuliani for making the time to be here, to Anoda, thank you for, for the point of view of EBL, and all the things that you're doing. I really appreciate you, Mr. Shah, for bringing yourself here. Uh, it's nice to be able to see that Big Cross being you know, very much in the forefront, both in Kepsa Foundation, but also in your company. Thank you, Karen, for bringing this event together, bringing all these people as you've done for many years. I think this is, if I'm not mistaken, year number six or seven, so it's fabulous to be able to see that. And finally, thank you. It's wonderful. The work that WWF has done, not just in Kenya, but then globally, and, and really brought the story out uh, for many young people like myself and you, actually, who will be inheriting the world um, in the next, actually, I think I'm 40, I'm still, you know. Uh, but for those who are younger than us, my two kids who really want to inherit a world they care about. So it's fabulous. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to invite all of you to a snack after this with social distancing. Uh, but uh, it would be nice to be here, and I look forward to seeing you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank Good. You. Thank you. Great job. Excellent. Thanks. 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 Thanks.